actually believe that the defining moment in Unitarian Universalism was Selma. It was the moment when Martin King telegraphed Dana Greeley during the board meeting in Boston and said, I need you, be here with me. And the board recessed and reassembled on the Pettus Bridge. Two-thirds of the, of the working ministers in our movement, two-thirds of ministers serving in churches, went to Selma. My ministry really did begin in Selma, almost precisely. It was uh, in the middle of that first year in Bloomington, Indiana, that the call to Selma came from, of course, Martin Luther King after the tragic events at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. The Board of Trustees of my church met immediately that evening and I joined them and uh, they said, well, obviously we have to be there. You'll go, won't you? <laughs> and that was it. I didn't think twice. Uh, during, during that uh, pilgrimage down to Selma, a, a, a few days before that, a black fellow, Jimmy Lee uh, Jackson, had been killed by the whites in, in Selma. And there was, no, there, there, there was no hue and cry about that. But as soon as James Reeb, a white Unitarian minister, got killed, big deal, big deal. Now, I'm not speaking against James Reeb. I'm just talk, uh, speaking about the double standard that was being applied. I was amazed how many colleagues were there and how many lay people, because I saw people I recognized from all over the country. And the, that was amazing. Just you know, one day after that call to have them all there, it, it was a real joy. Several of the, of the people from Selma recommended a particular luncheon shop and, uh, that served both blacks and whites because we wanted to be sure that it was open. And uh, in that group was uh, Jim Reed and also Homer Jack. Well, Homer was a little portly, as everybody may remember, and he didn't want to walk. So Jim Reed tossed his coat in the back of my car, and I drove Homer to that restaurant. We parked directly in front of it, and you know we all sat around these teeny tiny tables. They were miniature little things, and Jim was at a different table, as, as were the others that you would know, uh, Orloff Miller and uh, I forget the last name. <laughs> I know him well. In any event, uh, after we finished dinner, we, we finished a little earlier, or lunch, I guess. After we finished, no, it must have been dinner. It was late. It was late in the afternoon because the sun began to set. Anyway, it's hard to remember times and places. Um, Homer and I left. Homer swore, swore later that he saw the thugs that eventually um, injured two and, and killed the third, um, Jim Marie. But we didn't. I don't think we saw, we saw any thugs. We got in the car and drove back to the chapel. And the moment we got there, we learned that three of our ministers had been injured. So we immediately rushed over to the black infirmary because there was no way that they could be treated at the local white hospital. They wouldn't allow civil rights workers to be treated at all. So at the black infirmary, we learned that, that uh, Jim Reed was very, very seriously injured. The other two were, were reasonably okay, um, and that they had left for Birmingham for the, for the hospital uh, in an ambulance, a black ambulance, because a white ambulance wouldn't do it, and that they were followed. We knew that. And of course, that was pretty frightening because being followed, and, and the police had refused any escort of any kind, so we, we immediately drove to Birmingham, and luckily the ambulance had arrived without incident, and so did we. Uh, Homer and I were, were in the car alone, um, and there we learned that Jim was going to die, that his injuries would be fatal. Only the machines were keeping him alive. They were waiting for the family. And Duncan Hollow showed up first, which was very nice. I, I had met him before, knew him as a distinguished uh, senior colleague as he is today. Um, Duncan uh, and the family eventually made the decisions to turn off the machines. And immediately, of course, uh, Homer wanted to make plans for what the Unitarian Universalists would do about um, this death. What, what would the arrangements be? 
And he immediately went to Montgomery. We went to Montgomery. I, I was his chauffeur from that point forward. So we, we drove to Montgomery and uh, went through the most amazing um, labyrinth of, of um, security, I guess it's the word, to, to get to Martin Luther King and, and James Abernathy. We had to be driven. We couldn't take our car. We w were driven in a very strange, dr I couldn't have guessed where we were going or where this place was. Um, there were guards at, outside, guards inside, guards in the hallway, guards everywhere. And we were escorted into this tiny bedroom in a back hallway somewhere, which had only one window. I stood in front of it, I figured, I, I was still a dumb kid from the north. I didn't know this most dangerous place to be. But Jim Abernathy walked in first. He was very friendly and really, really nice. And, and the whole leadership of us, as of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, walked in um, and until finally uh, Martin Luther King walked in. And I, I was amazed first that he was very small. I thought of him as being big and <laughs> tall. And, and imposing, he was not at all, he was a very small man, and his hands were very soft. When he shook hands, his hand was small and soft, which surprised me like crazy. And his, his immediate question to Homer was, what are the Unitarians gonna do? Do you, do you want a service of your own? Do you wanna just go, do you wanna just leave and go back? And you know, we would understand, you know, when you've suffered like this, we, we would understand. And Homer said, no. We want a service here. There will be one in Washington, D.C., but um, we don't want to leave. We're with you in this, in this uh, cause. I don't know on what strength he said that. I hope it was the f with the full the backing of the denomination. It certainly seemed to be from then on, but I was just delighted and, and overjoyed, and, and King very quickly left the room, and that was the last time I saw him up close. Um, but it was a very impressive moment. We, we uh, landed in, in uh, Montgomery, and of course no public transportation was available for anything, anywhere, anytime, no facilities. If you had to go to the John, tough luck, you know, you'd get hostile crowds. If you moved even to the side of the road, they would make it clear you weren't gonna pass, you weren't going anywhere, you were gonna stay on the road, and that was that. Um, and we marched all the way into town. There wasn't really any other way to do it, you know, between very hostile lines of people on both sides. And we were all there for the uh, for Martin Luther King's talk and, and the rest of, of those um, events as the Selma March ended. The General Assembly prior to Cleveland this was in Denver and the where lecture was Saul Alinsky. I can't say this is necessarily prepared the way for what came to happen, but certainly Saul's uh, a presentation and involvement and confrontation in terms of community development, community organization, put um, kind of a floor uh, of awareness on uh, issues of social change, the process for social change. He described his tactics in dealing with City Hall in Chicago. The way to get, your, get something accomplished, he said, is um, to, to polarize the issue. If you can somehow frame the question before the House in such a way that you can demand an up or down vote, no amendments, just yes or no, up or down, uh, no alternatives. Uh, he said, if you can get it framed that way, if, even if you start out with only 10% of the people with you, no, even 5%, he said, you can win the day, you can get there. Our leadership in Boston felt obliged to organize some kind of an examina examination of how we UUs were going to respond to the increasingly militant position of black leadership, including Martin Luther King, but not confined to him by any means. That part of it was called the UU response to the Black Rebellion, which was an interesting choice of title. It was made in Boston by Homer Jack, basically. And it was Homer Jack who issued the invitations. Homer was a parishioner of mine. We were very close friends, had been ever since 1945. I was very much aware of what Homer was up to, what he was, what he was getting at. 
Uh, he was genuinely afraid that we had a black caucus forming out across the country, loosely, hadn't gotten together. But he wasn't prepared for the fact that when, when we opened the conference at Biltmore, it was a reality. <laughs> they had gotten a room for themselves and stationed a marshal at the door, <laughs> and only blacks were welcome. And about 30 out of the 37 blacks went into the room and participated. Well, what we wanted to do was get together and decide our own de destiny ourselves. It wasn't about separating ourselves or anything like that, but we wanted to do our own destiny ourselves. You can't empower people. People have to empower themselves. You know, and, 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 and I think they understand that. I think, I think what, they, what, what, what they're afraid of is that what happens after a person empowers themselves? I, I could see nothing wrong with this. We have caucuses all the time, all through history we've had caucuses of people with like concerns of some kind or another, like agendas. But the fact that they were black, that was pretty scary. Most reluctantly, the, the conference group there approved the um, proposal of the, of the black caucus for um, a transfer of leadership in the racial justice uh, uh, work of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Uh, it was obvious that a great rift had occurred during that because some of my white colleagues were extremely uncomfortable about the, uh, the behavior aspect of withdrawing into a closed caucus and coming out with demands instead of with suggestions or motions. I was emboldened and heartened by the audacity of the leaders of the Black Caucus to um, uh, demand that uh, this congregation um, relate itself in a relevant sort of way to the struggles that were taking place uh, all across urban America, particularly. Uh, the riots, uh, well, they call them r r riots, we, we prefer to call them rebellions. Uh, blacks who had been not only disenf disenfranchised, but uh, just, just you know, spit upon, uh, literally. And um, uh, the question of us blacks in this predominantly white uh, de de denomination was, to what extent could we persuade the, de the denomination to use some of its resources to come to the, uh, to the rescue of those folks out there in the street? So we are saying we cannot just walk by blithely and look at that situation as some sort of a scholarly adventure or something, you know. I mean, to some extent, we have to do something about our brothers and sisters out there, and we have to persuade our white brothers and sisters to help us. So out of that general attitude um, grew the, the demand that the uh, UUA uh, allocate X number of dollars specifically uh, one million dollars over a four-year period to um, to fund various black community activities around the country. They came back, went back to their congregations and said, we need to have a conference. We need to have, we need to start caucuses around the country and we need to have a, a, a meeting of all the blacks we can get together at some point so we can start helping them to make a response. Now understand that our, um, our leader was Haywood Henry, a, y a young uh, PhD uh, candidate uh, at Boston, was it Boston? Yeah, Boston University in microbiology, who is uh, similarly frustrated by what's happening out there, and he, and he is in no way related to that. He's from the South, he's from um, New Orleans. And um, I guess when we were in the talking stages of the Black Caucus, I would imagine that uh, Haywood probably thought that um, this is something that we could do and kind of do in a hurry, and then he'd be able to go back to his books and get his PhD and so forth, you know. Um, except as we as we tried to address the problem using this, the, the, uh, this mechanism, he discovered that that was a full-time job. 
for goodness sake. Not only he, but also Dick Trailer, who is now called M. Gen Z uh, Trailer, and also um, uh, Walimu uh, Imari, who at that time was uh, was Ren uh, Renford Gaines, uh, the Reverend Renford Gaines. In Chicago, nearly all of the churches some the few blacks in the various churches and some who had not been Unitarians that long uh, met at our church, which is the church that Jack Mendelssohn was the minister of. I became the, um, the head of the Chicago chapter of, uh, of Buck. And um, according to Haywood, uh, our chapter was the most active chapter of, of, of all in, in the whole country. We had a pretty good size uh, membership, as I recall. I don't know, a, a couple of dozen, something like that, which, which for our caucuses was an awful lot of people. Many people were opposed to the idea of a Black Affairs Council because it sounded too separatist. Um, we subsequently had a meeting of all the black members of the Berkeley Church, and there wasn't even a controversy among the members of the Berkeley Church. Um, so I was designated to go to that meeting in Chicago and vote against the establishment of a Black Affairs Council because of the separatist nature of it. I got to Chicago, and I didn't know there were so many black Unitarian Universalists. <laughs> Man, I was surprised, and, and also I was surprised at, 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 the, uh, at, at, at the, the wide range of professions. We had an oceanographer, uh, we, we had a guy who owned an electronics company. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, man, when I saw all these folks, I said, hell, this is something to this, you know. It was not a feel-good meeting to me. Um, people were very strident, I thought, um, divisive. It was one of these, if you're not just gung-ho with us, you're uh, against us. And so I came back to Detroit and organized the largest caucus in the country. Yeah, you know, and in fact, it, 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 they recognized my ability to organize the caucus, and we had our first national meeting in Detroit, you know, because of my efforts in, in getting the thing organized. My report back to the church was that um, this thing was going to go through um, because the, there were very few voices. Um, against it. So again, I was designated to go to Cleveland to vote against it again. And that was my first experience with General Assembly. The request came to us from the from back uh, that we would create a uh, white support organization for the uh, for back and so uh, we did and it happened at the Universalist Church of the Restoration that we had our founding meeting with uh, most of the leaders from the uh, Black Affairs Council being with us. One thing that Rudy Gelsey had said to me was uh, the blacks uh, uh, and this was reflecting the leadership from the St. Uh, from the uh, Los Angeles group the blacks there are too few of them. They cannot possibly prevail at the General Assembly alone on their own resources and with their own limited numbers. The, the only hope the Black Caucus has of a favorable vote at Cleveland on the, on the, on the million dollars for four years for black uh, empowerment is uh, the formation now, immediately, and, ac and across the continent of a white support group. Well, I suppose it was twofold. Uh, partly it was a response to the accusation that uh, the Buck people were separatist. We wanted to demonstrate that there was another point of view. We didn't consider them to be separatist at all. We saw the formation of a black UU uh, caucus as being legitimate in the face of the special situation which, in which they lived, not only 
in society as a whole, but within our movement. And the other reason was to make clear to other whites that there was strong white support for the Black Affairs Council, that uh, it was a, a genuine partnership effort on the part of whites with blacks to establish the council, to create a new, uh, more powerful intervention of our religious movement into the expanding circles of racial justice concern. So that was the basic reason for it. It was, it was largely political motivation. We had to win votes. The organizing conference of Fullback was held at Germantown at the church of which I was minister in early April 1968. Fullback and Buck uh, had uh, joint meetings. In fact, we were having a joint meeting of the two leadership cadres about a altogether about a dozen of us in Philadelphia when Martin Luther King was assassinated. Because we'll never forget that. We were, we were seated together at a table in the uh, Germantown Unitarian Church, having supper together, when a woman burst into the room wailing, a black woman, wailing and saying they've killed him, they've killed Dr. King. Well, that was like a thunderbolt hitting that, that parish hall. And uh, we almost immediately separated. The blacks in the group said, we've got to be by ourselves. You don't, don't mind, uh, but we've got to go off, be by ourselves. So we whites went off to be by ourselves to Dave Park's house. He was the minister there at the time and lived in a parsonage near the church. And so we went to his, his home, we whites did, and we sat and watched the television all oh, practically through the night. I don't remember if we get any sleep at all. Earlier that year, I met a young man from Chicago and we uh, discussed uh, the issues before us, uh, 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 Buck's issues, and uh, he asked if I would uh, would uh, support uh, the resolution for funding for uh, Buck back. And I said I would on two conditions: one that you have no racial bars to uh, the meetings that you, that you hold, and that there be full account of accounting, uh, accountability for the funds that you receive. That is, uh, people, if you, if you expect money from an institution or a person, then you should uh, divulge what you, uh, you do with the money. And uh, I received firm assurances from him that this is what uh, would happen and uh, therefore I sat down and I wrote a resolution in support of uh, Buck Back. But why was an idea that had been proposed by Cornelius McDougall, who was a black member of Community Church of New York, and Cornelius McDougall and his minister, Don Harrington, uh, came up with this idea of a black and white alternative. We went to Cleveland and Don Harrington, I knew Don Harrington and I knew uh, McDougall. We got together and talked and uh, I said, well, what's, what's happening? He said, well, we're not quite sure yet. It looks as if uh, this uh, thing for Buck, uh, Buck is going. And so I went to uh, the colleague that had talked with me uh, and said, now, what is the deal here? I said, I, I provide a resolution for, in support of funding for this organization. And I was told, no, that, that has gone by the board. It, our board of directors has said uh, no to uh, both of those questions. 
And if your wife uh, wants to be a member of, uh, of uh, Buck, uh, she has to declare herself black. And I looked him in the eye and I said, you're crazy. I said, that'll never happen. I don't even understand it. And so I just backed off. And I went back over to uh, the uh, Bawar grouping. It wasn't even, it was called uh, uh, black and white uh, alternative at that uh, time. And uh, Don Harrington and McDougall asked if I would uh, take a leading role in, uh, in organizing uh, this group. And I said, <coughs> yes, I will do that. I said, because I don't think that that I have been given the proper information uh, to, uh, to do otherwise. A, a bunch of us who were very concerned uh, got together and said, all right, we've got to make, do something to represent the fact that there are a lot of Unitarians, even here at the General Assembly, who don't concur with this idea. And it has to be obviously made up of, of both blacks and whites who've been working together for years and years. And so an ad hoc meeting gathered, and there were several hundred of us who went to it. And out of this, it was a kind of an amorphous situation. Nobody set it up, but the conversation went on, and eventually we decided to convert this into an ongoing organization called not Black and White Alternative, but Black and White Action. Um, and uh, Glover Barnes and I were selected as the two co-chairs. Max Gabler. Uh, Reverend Dr. Gabler was there and they turned to him and said, said would you uh, work with Glover on this uh, matter? And uh, Max said, I would be just delighted. He said, Glover and I have gotten along and he said, I'd be delighted to work with him. So they put our names up when the organization started forming up uh, and we had a, a meeting they put our names up as co-chair of Bawa. By the time we got to Cleveland, which of course was the following June, Martin Luther King had been killed, Robert Kennedy had been assassinated, and so feelings in the country as a whole were running very strongly. When we got to Cleveland, I think the thing that uh, I, I had always assumed that being rational people, we would work something out that, would, that re recognized and respected all the legitimate interests and desires of everybody. But what I found was a very different picture. We tried, we, we did uh, buttonhole a number of uh, delegates there and uh, tried to get them to not to to go so fast on this thing that to allow some discussions and things like that. But there were there was a group of ministers who very much wanted to see this thing closed out now. And there were, of course, the, the Black Caucus people who wanted it closed out. We were both delegates at Cleveland. And I have never seen such an emotional orgy in my life. It was I, I wouldn't take a thing away from him. Haywood Hendry was a, an incredible orator and he just swept everybody off their feet. We have missed a very simple question and it is who will the black community follow? those who believe in its own participation and right to self-determination as our caucuses have attempted to investigate with them are those who offer paternalistic approaches. The reality of the moment to us is very clear. It should also be very clear to you. This is the most viable opportunity that we will have to ever be the Unitarian Universalist that we want to be. Haywood Henry was one of the brightest people I've seen. I mean, he was able to really um, present himself so well that a lot of people across the country, Unitarians, no matter what color they were, they were very, he was, he was an orator. After hours and hours of speeches back and forth, we came down to 
getting close to the final two speeches, pro and con, fun, shall we fund the Black Affairs Council at the rate of $1 million over four years, $250,000 a year. The pro forces uh, sort of passed up the line to be at the head of the line. Do, do, do you mind if he goes ahead of you sort of thing? James Luther Adams, the great Unitarian Universalist, theologian, social ethicist, teaching at Harvard. On the other side, at the con microphone, Dana Greeley came down off the dais and was being passed forward toward the microphone. I was young, I was brash, I was inappropriate, yeah, probably accurate, but inappropriate. Uh, I walked up to Dana <laughs> and said something approximately like, my God, Dana, you've spoken on this three or four times. We know what you have to say. Why don't you let somebody else talk? And I think it's indicative of the level of feeling that existed on that floor. You know, one, <laughs> that some young dumb minister would, <laughs> would approach the president of the association and <laughs> say that but also that the Dana Greeley, who was every inch the gentleman, a uh, three-piece suit, uh, unflappable, unflappably gentlemanly demeanor, responded by reaching out and shoving my chest. It, you know, it, it was painful having that level of antagonistic energy in that room. Uh, the overwhelming nature of the vote at Cleveland, 72% a majority, almost three out of every four voters present, attests the, uh, the, the depth of the uh, concern about the issue and also the uh, tremendous support in the ranks, uh, clergy and laity, all sectors of the denomination. Although we lost the vote, there was a cohesiveness among the Ibawa uh, supporters. And they were coming in, people would just say, well, what are we going to do? And when we'd, uh, we had some cards, got some cards together, we'd have said, here, sign a card and uh, just, uh, we'll just do something. For those of us you know, supportive of the Black Affairs Council, it was a celebratory. We can do it. it you know, it's possible. We've just done, you know, we've agreed to do something unprecedented. <laughs> the feeling was, was a liberation at long last. Uh, um, um, blacks were, were, were being discovered as an integral part of the association, you know. It was not only liberating, but but it was it was, it was a kind of feeling uh, that we were doing something. Yeah, we were doing something for black folks, um, and, and, and 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 in many cases we were successful at doing it. The Black Affairs Council did convene. We held a series of meetings. We were very productive. We we began to spend that $250,000 almost entirely uh, in, I mean overwhelmingly, it was for program activities. The only expenses we had basically were our meetings. That was, that was the only money we spent on ourselves. The Black Affairs Council invested in a little-known California professor named Ron Karenga, 
who was pursuing his dream of beginning an African-American uh, winter holiday that came to be known as Kwanzaa. Uh, we, we were very careful about the money. We expected accountability. Ben Scott was our treasurer and he had a real business sense and, and, a, and a very uh, great determination that we weren't going to be subject to the accusation, well, you give money to those black folks and they'll just fill the bathtubs up with coal, you know, and stuff like that. He was just determined that that was not going to be the fate of this effort. So he was very careful about money. We all were. The General Assembly also voted significant money for theological education. Uh, and I went back and looked at the minutes of the meeting and they voted $110,000 for Star King, $70,000 for Meadville, and $50,000 for Harvard. That's an additional $185,000. And then they also voted for additional funding for districts. The board took, apparently took these actions and what, as I, my remembrance of it is that they just merely added these new things on to what they had already had as a budget. And so without having other sources of income, they automatically created a deficit budget. The Black Affairs Council, when it became an issue in 1968 and 1969, was added to a budget that was already hopelessly unrealistic thanks to years of irresponsible decisions by the UUA board to grow expenses uh, and in turn make unrealistic income assumptions, particularly about giving from the congregations through the annual fund, but also generically about fundraising. There was, I think, a wonderful opportunity in June, July, August of 68 to raise an incredible amount of money from Unitarian Universalists who had given a very clear indication that this was a program they were behind. While I was looking, remember looking for ways in which additional fundraising would take place, I do not remember any additional fundraising ever taking place. Almost nothing came out of 25 Beacon Street to capture that energy from Cleveland. And it, one of the what ifs is, what if that had been handled differently? How much of a difference would that have made in the financial crisis that became apparent in the UUA in 69-70? It couldn't have made it worse. <laughs> Those of us uh, at Cleveland assumed that, based on the understanding that the General Assembly had, uh, had the power to authorize uh, expenditures, assumed that this was a four-year commitment by the UUA. But then, the qu leaping ahead now, the question arises, why then did the matter come up again at the Boston General Assembly in 1960? If Cleveland has decided for the next four years why are we at Boston, just a year hence, uh, considering a motion to fund the Black Affairs Council? We made that decision in Cleveland a year ago. The UUA board was really unhappy with being told what to do. And they did what boards and executives often do when unhappy with directives being given. They did something that subverted. By the time we came to 69 in Boston, it was apparent that it was going to be a hectic General Assembly because the planning committee, which makes up the agenda, had uh, determined that we would do everything the way we normally do and, and even including electing the new president. We were going to elect a new president uh, to the association. We were going to do all that before we got to the funding issue. That was going to be the end. Because that was going to be contentious, and so we wanted all the smooth stuff to go first. Well, as soon as we 
knew what the agenda determinations were. Uh, the Black Affairs Council, but its cohorts in Fullback and Buck. We immediately determined that we were going to try to get the agenda changed. Uh, we were astonished when the first order of business turned out to be an attempt to change the to change the uh, to change the order of business. You know what's the big deal? <laughs> we're, de we're dealing with some really important questions here. What's this big deal that we can't change the agenda? It's sacrosanct. But this effort to change the agenda was a clear attempt to, to derail the UUA board's attempt to try to bridge the gap by doing a lot for 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 uh, back and a little bit for Bala. The Black Affairs Council, but particularly Buck, the Black UU Caucus, had organized itself very well. They had uh, all together something over a hundred delegates, maybe a hundred, hundred and twenty-five delegates there, legitimate delegates. They had mapped out where every microphone was. They were all all organized to uh, to have somebody at every mic so that w whenever there was a pro, there was a con, a pro, a con. There was always somebody prepared to speak. It was really quite a quite a raucous debate. The mood at the plenary sessions was dire. It was a crisis atmosphere. It was an atmosphere of much political maneuvering. The vote was set up in such manner that Bawa couldn't even get any funding. They say, if you fund, if you give them a penny, we're out of here. I said, wait, wait, wait a minute, where's inclusiveness here? My feeling, I had a feeling of outrage that if that got 350,000, 500,000, or a million dollars, and Bao Wa couldn't get 50,000. There's something wrong with this equation. Glover Barnes and Betty Seiden and I were the ones that had to stand up and face this tumultuous assembly uh, in behalf of Bao Wa, and it was not easy, but we, we did it. It was very contentious. There was a notable shoving match that I engaged in with Max Gabler, then the minister at our church in Madison, Wisconsin, and a leader of Boa. We were waiting at one of the microphones to speak, and Max stepped out of line. And in the mood of the time, that was tantamount to giving up his position in line. And when he returned, assuming that he would return to the place that he had left, I had taken it, and Max came to me and bumped me and pushed me, and I pushed him back. It was an era of considerable rudeness on all sides. It was a tough uh, fight. I went to the podium, and some people said they'd not heard a sermon like that before. I didn't record it. I had there was no recording. It was it was impromptu. It was straight from the heart, and. Uh, I spoke to the General Assembly. We finally came to the vote. And uh, when the vote was called and the vote taken, it was a substantial majority to change the agenda. But it fell short of the two-thirds. So Joe Fisher, the moderator, ruled, motion fails. Well. Apparently, by pre-arrangement, which I didn't know anything about, virtually all of the black delegates got up and, and left, solemnly marched out to the hushed silence of the rest. Finally, rustles and boos and catcalls and stuff like that. And uh, Joe Fisher declared a uh, recess. The place was in in shock. A point had come in the business of the association where there was a crisis of conscience and the 
black delegates to the assembly uh, did not feel heard, had felt dismissed by the assembly, and there was a, a wrenching time where it appeared as though the entire association were on the verge of collapse. The first thing I did was gather myself together and go looking for the blacks. I didn't know where they'd gone. I f soon found them in one of the uh, function rooms of the Statler Hotel, it was called then, Park Plaza now. I found them all, they were all there. And they were in disarray, they were weeping, tears running down their faces, they were hugging and kissing and, and uh, saying goodbye. They were going to leave, they were going to leave Boston, going to leave the movement. And uh, I asked if I could speak, and they permitted me to speak, and I told them that I was as, as disappointed and betrayed as they felt, and um, that I wished they'd at least stay around long enough to see if we could do anything about it. I said, I'll go back in to the General Assembly and ask for the right to speak. And, uh, I will tell them what my feelings are and what I see you preparing to do, which is to leave the movement. Will you stay around long enough for me to have a chance to see what kind of support we can muster in there? So it was agreed that I could go back in. I went to Joe Fisher and Dana, put my arm around both of them, and said, you know, something big is happening here. I, I want a point of personal privilege. I want to have a chance to tell the delegates who remain here what's going on. And when Joe Fisher reconvened the group, he gave me a point of personal privilege, as it was called, to make a statement. I told people what I had just experienced, seeing the black delegates preparing to leave, leave the movement, leave Boston. And I explained that the way to understand how they feel is, they feel as if they've just been told to go to the back of the bus again. And uh, that metaphor was immediately meaningful. <laughs> back of the agenda, back of the bus. Well, um, there were applause and cheers and hisses and boos and raised fists. And, and I said, in light of this, I cannot remain here and pretend that I'm conducting business as usual. This is not a time of business as usual. I'm going to go over to Arlington Street Church, which is just a block away up here, as everybody knew. And uh, anybody who would like to join me would be welcome to come. And so I started down from the platform, walking toward the exit. And one of, one of my colleagues, Horace Westwood, a fellow I'd known, you know, all of my career, uh, big guy, even as tall as I was at those days, I was six foot three. Uh, he, he came up to me and spit right in my face. <laughs> oh, and people were really, I talked to another fella afterwards, another colleague, who said, you know, if I'd have had a pistol, I'd have shot you. That's how strong the, the feelings were. As I was leaving from my seat, next to me was sitting a white colleague, uh, and he said, uh, as I was leaving, he said, good riddance. And he said it with real hate in his voice and uh, in his posture. It, it was wrenching to be part of, part of the group that walked off the floor, walked out with the sense, we may not be back. <laughs> Yeah, may, maybe this is it. Uh, and <laughs> for some of us, that, that was a <laughs> my career in what? Um, but we didn't have time to really wrestle with that. It, 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 yeah, it was happening. Do you know there are people headed out the door? Am I going out the door? That was the time frame in which the choice got made. I, oh, I couldn't believe it. Um, 
without even thinking. Um, I didn't really give any conscious thought to what I was going to do, but I just ran up to um, the, um, the uh, what do you call it, the Diaz, the platform, the podium, whatever. And the only idea in my head was, um, everybody's not leaving, uh, I'm here. And I just stood up there and, and cried as I watched people walk out. <sighs> the walk out, tearful, um, joyous, we went out singing, I can't remember what. Um, made our way to Arlington Street. Listened to interminable speeches. Hours and hours and hours of speeches from that pulpit way high up in the air. Hundreds of us fell in line and filed out of the hotel, crossing the street to go to Arlington Street. I remember the glare of the television cameras. I remember the tears that were crossing my cheek as we left. Almost all of the youth left. We set up camp at Arlington Street Church and we pondered what our situation was. The uh, LRY kids were up on the balcony with their bare feet hanging over, sitting on the railings. Now, they never allow that today. But they were up there sitting on the railings, their feet, their bare feet hanging over. Um, now I went up to sit in the balcony and I listened for a while, but it seemed, it seemed just as boring as the General Assembly itself, so I, I wandered on. I left, but I was not satisfied with either places and so kind of wandered around Boston on my own, <laughs> feeling not exactly connected with either and very distressed and very sad and also really realizing I was going to serve on the Board of Trustees. So we kind of solidified ourselves at Arlington Street Church as to what we were doing. We were asking for a replay of what had just happened, like an appeal. And I volunteered that I would get the Black Caucus leadership and Dana Greeley and his board leadership together, but particularly Dana and, and Haywood Henry, and begin talking about how to resolve this. And finally, Dana Greeley, uh, a man for whom I have now considerable respect, he finally came over, I'm sure having met with his uh, leadership council for some hours to decide how to handle this. And he stood in that pulpit and tears streaming down his cheeks called us to come home, reminded us that we were part of a family and that families don't settle disputes in this way. And we did go back. We were asked to come back and following Jack Mendelson, who we trusted, and one or two others uh, who we trusted, we went on back and finally, you know, negotiated to get this, um, this million dollar promise that was never, you know, never actualized. Um, appreciate that you had this mixture of anger, one, and hopefulness. And they finally re reached an agreement that uh, the blacks would come back and the agenda item would be moved up and that we would get a vote. What kind of marvelous resolution. To fund either Bach or Bawa, but not both. And then tacked on in the same motion to move as rapidly as possible, not later than fiscal year 1970-71, to a balanced budget re based on realistic projections of prospective incomes. Um, a catastrophe. When the vote was finally taken on funding back, but not BOA, it won. Uh, so we had another year, a year of grace. We did finish the assembly together, but the strains were very evident.
What we didn't know then, and what I imagine most delegates to the General Assembly still don't know, is that the General Assembly has no fiscal authority whatsoever. And the General Assembly can say anything it wants to the board, and the board is not required to fulfill the promises of the General Assembly. The board is the fiscal agent of the association. And the board, shortly after the election of Robert Nelson West, the board discovered that not only could it not possibly fulfill its commitment to the Black Affairs Council, but it couldn't fulfill its $100,000 commitment to LRY, also made in that same heady time um, when we were demanding uh, a share of the action. I inherited major problems when I took office, of which the back controversy was one. The most immediate and pressing was financial. We already were in a fiscal year for which the annual budget was $2,600,000 and the income was $1,600,000. All of the unrestricted capital had been spent by the previous administration. About six months into my term, I discovered that in addition, our bank held an open demand note for $450,000. And the last $50,000 on that note had been borrowed two weeks before the General Assembly at which I was elected. The board was set to meet in October. We were going to meet in Boston. There was to be a march dealing with uh, the Vietnam protest. So the venue for the board was changed to Washington, D.C. So as a board, we could participate in the Vietnam <laughs> at, a, at the protest march, which we did. I am sure many board members were shocked by the starkness and depth of the financial problems I conveyed and the subsequent recommendations I made to cope with them. For example, terminating the employment of more than 50 UUA employees including all of the staff members in the district offices, approving a 40% budget cut that meant eliminating or reducing amounts available for a number of programs, reorganizing the UUA headquarters organization, as well as bringing into being seven inter-district offices for field services, and not being able to contribute to the Black Affairs Council as large an annual amount as was voted by the 1968 Cleveland General Assembly. I don't believe that we had a copy of this proposed budget prior to getting to Washington, D.C. It may have been. I mean, this was the pressure that both he was under and uh, the board was under. But I can remember receiving it and was anguished first realizing the nature of that we did have to bring a balanced budget. That was not a question. But the nature of this and the catastrophic effect both on the districts and the support for the Black Affairs Council. What distressed me even more was that that this action was done unilaterally. Uh, and I finally decided that I could not vote for the budget because of this reason, both the district funding and the Black Affairs Council. And so before the meeting uh, took place, I did speak with Bob and I told him, I said, Bob, I can't vote for this for this reason. And I was one of two members of the board that did not vote for it. Jim Lee from Florida also did not vote for it, and his basic reason had to do with districts. In January of 1970, when the UUA board decided to reconsider the funding of the Black Affairs Council, a number of us drove from Chicago and around the country to attend that board meeting. It was a 
tense meeting just because of the of we were all lining the walls around the board members because it was still a very sm a relatively small room uh, and there was you know reaction to each person in the board who spoke because most of the people who spoke were on the board and it was clear there were very few votes in favor of anything other than the president's proposed budget very few when the moderator announced the result of the vote, all of us who were attending erupted in singing, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. So I remember uh, this uh, young housewife from Westport, Connecticut, named Denny Davidoff, screeching at the board, no! What will we tell the children in Sunday school? And a few other things that I don't recall precisely, but she was clearly greatly distressed. That's my most vivid memory of Denny Davidoff until I joined the UUA board when she was the moderator. Uh, All I know is that I was very, very disappointed because we had, we had these uh, community projects pr pretty well moving along, you know. And uh, as they got ready to, to make their uh, evolution to the next stage of their, of their, their development, there was no money. There was, there was no money available for them. So. Uh, my view uh, of, the, of how you put a budget together then, and actually I learned it then, uh, but it's a view that has uh, shaped my thinking for 30 years uh, as well, is that a budget in fact reflects the fundamental values and choices of the organization, uh, and that by voting uh, to fund uh, the Black Affairs Council. Uh, that should be, have been incorporated uh, in terms of the way one thinks about it directly into the budget uh, and the uh, denomination should have been prepared to make uh, choices inside that budget uh, that would have allowed that to be funded. I believe then those choices were possible. I still believe those choices were possible. The rumor began that the denomination was broke because of the vote to give a million dollars to the Black Affairs Council. This rumor had absolutely no basis in fact. None. Zero. Zip. The denomination was broke in terms of its funds, the unallocated, the unrestricted funds, were gone before that vote to fund back was ever taken. The rumor was allowed to flourish during the first years of the West administration. Why? My belief is that rather than going up against the mystique of Dana McLean Greeley, which was always larger than life, Bob West preferred just not to say that the denomination was broke before any money was voted for the Black Affairs Council. I suggest that this failure of nerve, and I cannot call it anything but that, uh, was, has resulted in the fact that this myth continues to this day, 30 plus years later, and this is probably the great tragedy. By the succeeding year in 1970, the will to continue funding Black Affairs Council was pretty much gone on the part of a majority. And the will to keep struggling was pretty much gone on the part of some white supporters and some of the black participants who were disappointed about the way things were going. What happened <clears throat> is that blacks became disillusioned about what the hell was going on and just started leaving the church. And in fact, the, uh, in fact, you know, you know what, what really happened is that um, there, there, there were a couple of Baptist churches in Detroit and you know, and the Baptists caught on to what was going on, and they started working in the community. And a lot of our folks have gone over to the Baptist church, you know. 
and said at one time, I said one time, I, I think we had about 70 blacks in our church at the high point. And then uh, one Sunday, uh, my wife looked at me and said, Joe, I said, you know what? We're the only black family in this church now. Uh, we organized uh, an effort at the 1970 General Assembly to have that vote effectively reversed. Uh, but by then the tide had turned. Uh, uh, membership was dropping. Uh, financial support to the UUA was dropping. Uh, the, so many of the folks who had had their spirits raised by the 1968 and 69 General Assemblies had effectively given up by then, particularly the black African Americans who had supported been a part of Buck and supported back. Uh, the disappointment uh, and disillusionment was uh, rampant, uh, but it was also rampant among many white folks. It was much harder to get support uh, for the, at the 1970 General Assembly. And so the, the vote there, where again we lost, and that was the first time we lost in, the, in a vote in the General Assembly, uh, was really the, effectively the end for the next, I'd say, that's at least the next 10 years, um, we were very busy um, raising money. Uh, we, um, we sent out a newsletter, um, letters getting um, membership, and we began to publish um, our project papers. We published five project papers and they were sort of a how to do it manual of things that were going on in different communities in different churches. July 1991. Dear Bawa board member, I believe it is time to bring closure to the fact, though not the memory of uh, black and white action, Bawa in the UU movement. Thus, I am informing the Washington State Secretary of State that BAWA is to be discontinued as a nonprofit organization under the code of the state of Washington. My last annual report to the state was in February 1991. I felt rescued by uh, finding BAWA and it was what kept me going for several years because the people I met in BAWA um, have been friends ever since. They were wonderful people. It was a great ride. With some pain, some stumbling, but it was a great ride. the issues of black empowerment went underground and were relatively invisible in the 70s and in the 80s. In our denominational history, it was such a painful time for people from all sides of the issues that we were reluctant to look at it, fearful of what wounds might be reopened, and consequently the black empowerment controversy has not received the kinds of attention and uh, recollections that it deserves and why this project is important because we have as a movement been reluctant to look at it. When the various caucuses surfaced, the women's caucus, I remember vividly when they decided that they would have a meeting at the General Assembly of the I think it was just, it was a women's fed, but it was a meeting closed to men. And there were men out, outside in the hall. I went, I always go to these things to see what's going on. And I stood in the hall and just listened. And they were furious. How can they cut us off? How can they keep us out? This is the Unitarian Uterosis Association. Everything should be open to everybody on any occasion. They could not understand why the women might need to talk together figure out what their real agenda was absent any men, and really start organizing for something that might be different from what they might have chosen. If there are any men, men around, same perfectly legitimate, reasonable, as the Gay Caucus did as it emerged. Um, and we had such trouble with those things. And even when we were able to accept, I think 
both the Women's Caucus and the Gay Caucus, we couldn't go back and look again at the Black Caucus and ask, was this really different? It really wasn't. There were a lot of feelings around it, and, and it had some economic agendas that probably were harder to, to take, but so what? The, the caucus was essentially the same message. We haven't gotten anywhere near where we have to go. That's a very, real sad feeling, because I'm retiring this year, and you know, I've put an awful lot of my life into this, and I don't, I don't see the change. I don't see anywhere near enough. So, you know, I remember some awfully good times and, and some wonderful people. But uh, we haven't gotten there yet. How do you solve it? You live into it. You make the, you, you, you spend the time. Ultimately, you probably solve it the way our, um, First Church Chicago at least has moved into it, and it's not doing very well now either, which is to uh, say with utter naivete, we're doing this because our faith commands us to, and we don't know what we're doing. This is a wilderness journey. Ours is a small religious association, and we need one another, and that period so divided us, so reduced our numbers, and so bruised many who otherwise would be our allies, that we would be wise in the future to take risks, but not to be too, too certain of our righteousness. And so it's a cautionary tale, and one whose effects live with us still, and whose memory needs to be kept alive, because the same possibilities, and the same challenges, and the same potholes face us still.